The U.S. Industrial Revolution came to age on the backs of unpaid workers toiling in sweatshops as much as 18 hours per day. Workers were exposed to dangerous work environments that frequently resulted in death and injury. Safety for these workers was nearly non-existent. It has been estimated that one out of every 50 workers was killed or seriously disabled from industrial accidents each year. These injured workers and their family members received little, if any, compensation. At the urging of President Roosevelt, the federal government took the lead and passed the first Workmen's Compensation Law in 1908, the Federal Employers Liability Act, that provided compensation to government workers suffering from on-the-job injuries. Around the same time, a few states also experimented and passed early workmen's compensation laws. However, all their laws were struck down as unconstitutional violations of due process. For example, the New York Court of Appeals declared the state's required workers' compensation law unconstitutional. On March 25, 1911, a fire at the Triangle Shirtwaist Company in New York City claimed the lives of 146 young garment workers. Factory managers had locked emergency exits in an effort to prevent employees from taking unauthorized breaks or stealing. Most of the victims were women and died of burns, asphyxiation, or blunt impact as they leaped from the building trying to escape the fire. The tragic event occurred the day after the New York Court of Appeals declared state workers' comp laws unconstitutional. This horrific event led to legislation requiring improved factory safety standards and also served as a major catalyst that brought attention to the plight of the injured workers. Wisconsin, followed by nine other states, adopted the first statewide constitutional workers' compensation law. All states within the Union had created various degrees of compensation protection to injured workers by 1949. These laws, however, were a double-edged victory. Workers and their families surrendered their right to sue their employer for work-related injuries and death in exchange for employers' agreement to provide reliable and prompt compensation. This give-and-take compromise between labor and industry has been labeled as the Great Trade-Off. After this flurry of state legislative activity, little progress was made to improve workers' compensation benefits nationwide. On December 29, 1970, President Richard Nixon signed the Occupational Safety and Health Act, OSHA, which gave the federal government authority to set safety and health standards for most of the country's federal workers. OSHA also established a bipartisan commission to look into state workers' compensation laws, in 1972, the Commission produced a unanimous critical report on state workmen's comp laws, stating, The inescapable conclusion is that state workmen's compensation laws in general are inadequate and inequitable. The National Commission made 84 recommendations in an effort to further five main goals. 1. Broad coverage of employees and of work-related injuries and diseases. 2. Substantial protection against interruption of income. 3. Sufficient medical care and rehabilitation services. 4. Encouragement of safety. And 5. An effective system for delivery of benefits and services. The Commission's recommendations played a significant role towards improving state workers' compensation laws. However, the progression did not last. Professor Emeritus John Burton, chair of the National Commission and noted scholar on workers' compensation, is quoted as saying, In the aftermath of the National Commission's report, there were substantial changes in a number of state laws improving these laws, but uh, that improvement has come to a, a, a halt and, if anything, a decline. The primary reason for this failure can be traced to the collective lobbying efforts of the insurance industry and large corporations. While employers' immunity remains protected, industry-backed legislation concentrates on lowering benefits, narrowing eligibility requirements, and putting medical treatment decisions in the hands of the insurance companies. Workers' compensation is now seen as a tool used for economic development, which pits one state against the other. This has spawned a race to the bottom with regressive reforms. What a pity it is that the Commission doesn't meet each decade.
The trade-off wars between labor and industry that began in 1911 are alive and well in the 21st century. Big money interests, with their vast financial resources, continue to create economic and legal obstacles that workers have to struggle against to be fairly compensated for workplace injuries. Workers deserve our protection and assurance that the promises made by industry in the Great Trade-Off are honored. The evisceration of the Great Compromise will continue. 100 years later, we are truly at another crossroads in our national approach to workers' compensation. Advocates for injured workers and their families need to leverage our collective resources to ensure that large corporations are prevented from making hard-working Americans second-class citizens dependent on government welfare programs. The price that the victims of the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire paid at the hands of corporate greed and lack of accountability should not be repeated, not now, nor ever.